We come now to the reading and preaching of God's Word. And this morning we'll be taking a look at Numbers 25, verses 1 through 13. So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to Numbers chapter 25. Again, we're looking at verses 1 through 13. And before we actually read God's Word and hear God speak to us, I invite you to join me in prayer, asking God's blessing upon that which He has for us this morning. Please join me. Lord God, we do come before you this morning, thanking you and praising you that you speak to us in a very special way, a very pointed way through your preached word. So we ask, Lord, you might do that this morning. Help us, Lord, to see through this text of Scripture how we can make a difference. Help us never to say, I'm just one person, what can I do? Enable us, Lord, to see we've got the Spirit indwelling us, and power equipping and enabling us, Lord. Lord, I ask you to be with me, your servant. Let the words I speak be not my own, Lord, but your words given to me, to speak to your people, to edify and build up, to turn hearts to yourself, to bring glory to your name. For we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Numbers chapter 25, a text which shows us how one person can make a difference. So give your attention now to God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Numbers 25, beginning of verse 1. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family, in the sight of Moses, and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by plague were 24,000. And the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, a priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and to descend us after him a covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. Sam knows what he sees just isn't right. There's sin abounding all around, and he wants to do something about it, but he thinks to himself, what can I do? I'm just one man. How can one person make a difference? Can you relate to Sam? You ever been there? Seeing something that's not wrong, you want to stand up and say something or do something, but you say to yourself, I'm just one man. I'm just one woman. What can one person do? How can I make a difference? This can be so common in our Christian walks. And that's why you want to pay careful attention this morning. Because through this text and through this message, you're going to see how you can make a difference. But you've got to be willing to stand up to do what others are unwilling to do. And know that you can do this because as our text shows, you can stand up because first, Jesus stands up for you. So let's walk back into the Israelite camp. And here's what I want you to see this morning. I want you to see first, sin entices you. Second, you need to stand up. Third, stand up for Jesus. And fourth, Jesus stands up for you. And this brings us to our big idea. I want you to hear these words, grab hold of them, and let them be why you never say to yourself, I'm just one person, what can I do? But let them encourage you to know that you can make a difference. Because here's your big idea. Jesus lies down so you can stand up. So first, sin entices you. Nobody typically wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I think I've got to plan out some sin today. I've got to make my to-do list. I've got to get the groceries, get some stamps, finish my school. I think I'll lie a couple times. I think I'll steal a little bit. And I think I'll cheat on my spouse today. 
Sin doesn't usually come about that way, does it? We don't plan it out. It's a little bit more subtle. It kind of sneaks up on us. And typically, it's when we're just hanging out with the world and we let our guard down. See, that's what's going on right here in our text with these Israelites. God's chosen people that he's brought out of Egypt and brought into the promised land. And he's got, what he's got? They're surrounded by all sorts of evil nations, pagan nations. So what does God say to them? He says, be on your guard. Be aware. Deuteronomy 7.3, he says, don't intermarry these, far, these foreign people surrounding you. Because they'll turn your sons away from me to turn after their gods. Hear what God's saying? Be weary of the world because they'll turn you away from me to chase after their gods. So God's telling them, steer clear of all these foreign women. They will steal your hearts. They'll turn you away from me and you'll chase after their gods. And this shows you how sin entices you. Look how our text begins. It drives us home. While Israel was living in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. This shows so clearly how sin entices you. Understand where Shittim is. This is basically the last stop before they enter into the promised land. It's right beside Moab. And they're surrounded by all these nations. What this means for you, though, is it's the last stop. All the hardships, all the difficulties, all the marching, all the uncertainty is coming to an end. They can see hope on the horizon. And this is typically when sin entices you. When all your hardships and difficulties are kind of behind you, you're no longer looking at God or crying out in prayer, but you're seeing the hope on the horizon. And what do you do? You take your focus off of God and start looking all around. That's like being in worship and kind of looking at, oh, it looks nice out today. And you start drifting. That's what these young men are doing. They're not looking at God or his covenantal promises. They're looking all around, and what do they see? These beautiful, attractive Moabite women. So they start hanging out with them, just getting closer and closer to them, thinking, what's the harm? I'll just hang out. We're not doing anything wrong. We're just spending a little time together. How could that go wrong? And look what it says. Look what it says in your text. How it leads them right into sin. It says, they were whoring with these daughters of Moab. This means they're yoking themselves together with those which they ought not to be with. God had already warned them, do not give yourselves to these foreign women. And what are they doing? Disregarding God's word. Thinking, we'll just kind of hang out, go our own way, and what happens? Next thing you know, they're whoring with the daughters of Moab. And you know what? This is how sin entices you. And that's what we need to be on our guard. See, don't think it could just happen to Israelites way back in the ancient lands, but it can happen to us today. Because we can hang out with the world, spend more time with the unsaved than we do with Christ and His church. Now understand something. I'm not saying you can't have unsaved relatives, unsaved friends, you can't be in the world. You ought to do that. But you need to be very careful, very weary about how much time you spend with them and how close you get with them. Because sin entices you, and it draws you away. That's what you're seeing right here in our text. They're spending more and more time with these Moabite women. And look what happens. You see how sin entices you. Look at verse 2. These invited the peoples to their sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Do you see what you're seeing right here? How sin entices you? It's driving that home. And what does it use? It uses smiles and pleasantries, invites and niceties. Hey, let's just get together and hang out. Come over for a meal. What could be wrong with that? You know what? Let's put our differences aside and just get together and be kind to one another. Can't we just do that? Can't we just all get along and just be friends? Forget your God and your religion. Just keep that on the side. Let's just all be friends. Can you imagine being a man or woman saying, no, I can't do that. I can't hang out with you because you might lead me astray. You might cause me to sin the way you're sinning. Not easy to say, is it? Very, very difficult to find those words leave your mouth, right? But that might be just what you need to do to avoid being enticed into sin. We need to be very weary about where we find our feet, how we spend our time, where we spend our resources, what gets our hearts. See, what you do is, what your heart desires is where you find you spend your time and your resources. Think about this. Right here you're seeing this downward progression of sin. It starts out with, hey, why don't you just come over for a meal? You know what, why don't we just have a little bit of fun? Next thing you know, they're bowing down to these false gods. 
That's why you need to hear very carefully what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. He says, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. This is why Jesus stands up for you, because he knows there's bad company all around, and we're inclined to go toward it, to hang out with it, give him our time and our attention and our affections. So Jesus stands up for you so you can stand up for him and not go that way. Think about it. When you're in the midst of the world and they're just inviting you over for a meal, hey, just come over for a barbecue, just kind of hang out. What can go wrong? What's the harm in spending a little time with your coworker for lunch? What do you see happen? This downward progression. It can start out with a simple invite for a meal and it winds up with bowing down at the altars of these false gods, just like you see in our text. Look at verse 3. Look what it says here. So, Israel yoked himself to the Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. See that key word that begins verse 3? So. So. What happened? They started hanging out with the Moabites, and so they bowed themselves down to Baal, a false god. And this highlights, shows so clearly how sin entices you. And highlights why God warns you about getting too close with the world. Again, you can be in the world, have company with the world, but don't get too close. Your closest relations should be in the church. It ought to be those who are united to Christ. Because the reality is this. We so easily, so slowly and surely get sucked in to sinful ways and practices. Because you get yoked to somebody who's outside the church. And you know what that means? You get yoked to their sins. You want to do what they do. Hang out and engage in the same practices. Just like these Israelites here with this downward progression, this downward spiral, it begins simply enough. Let's just hang out and eat lunch together. And you know what? You see the same thing today. I know you're thinking, that would never happen to me. I would never go bow down to Baal Peor. But ask yourself. Don't you regularly bow down to all these sinful companies that stand against Christ and His church? Amazon? Facebook? What do they do? They seek to stamp out Christianity, to put an end to it. And what do we do? We can't give enough of our time and our money. Why do we use Amazon? Because they want to stamp out Christianity? No, because we can save $3 and get next day shipping. I can't wait two days for my package. I need it tomorrow. So we willingly bow down at their altars, knowing they use their money, your profits, and what do they do? They put into all kinds of entities that want to stamp out Christianity. Why do we support them? Why do we spend our time and our money that way? Is it really worth saving $3 and getting next day delivery, knowing that's what they seek to do? To one day destroy you? To put you in some concentration camp somewhere? Is it going to be worth it? That, well, at least I got $3 in my pocket. I'm okay now. We need to think about what we do, how we spend our time. And understand what it says in your text. This angers the Lord. You hear that? Look at your text. It angers the Lord when you bow down to these ungodly, unrighteous things. Think about it this way. How would you feel if you came home and you found out your spouse was hanging out with some other man or woman? Would you be a little upset about that? Little? I'm like, wait, wait what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean you're going to dinner with him or her? You're mine, not theirs. Well, that's how God feels about your idolatry. That's how he feels when you spend all your time in the world and no time in his word or with his people. He's angry because he's jealous. That's what he's getting at right here. See, God cares very much how you spend your money, how you spend your time, where you find your feet. He cares what you do. Ask yourself, how much time do you spend in the world and how much time do you spend with the church? Is Sunday morning for an hour, hour and a half enough? You need more. That's why God calls you to this covenantal family. So you can be with one another. Not just on Sunday morning, but Tuesday evening, Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning for breakfast. Get together with one another. That gives you what you need to stand up for Jesus. And that's why he stands up for you, so you can do just that. Because think about it. You know God is angry at your sin. So what does he do? He sends his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, whom he loves, to go to the cross and die for you. He sheds his blood to propitiate your sin, to appease God's wrath. How amazing is that? God ought to crush you, but he doesn't. He crushes his son instead. So knowing that, why would you say, no thanks God, I'd rather hang out with Facebook and Amazon. 
Why not say, I want to be with you, the one who gave your son for me. I want to be with you who gave your life for me. I want to be with your people who had the same thought mind as me, who had the same desires. I want to see people saved, people come to saving faith, understanding that Jesus Christ sheds his blood so you can do just that. That's why he goes to the cross. That's how Jesus stands up for you. So you're willing to stand up for him and understand sin abounds all around it. It slowly entices you, calls you in. So what will you do? Will it be business as usual because I need to save $3 and get next day delivery? Or will you say, you know what, I can make a difference. I may just be one person, but I don't need to get books from Amazon. I get them from Olive Green, a Christian company. It might cost me a dollar more, take an extra day of shipping, but it's worth it because they promote Christian causes. Think about what you do. Think about how sin entices you. And think about the consequences of that sin. Understand this. Jesus lies down so you can stand up. So why not stand up knowing that God demands no less? Which brings us to our second point. You need to stand up. Do you ever really think about the consequences of your sin? I mean, really stop and think. I'm not just talking about how, like, oh, it might be more difficult for you. But I'm talking about what it really demands. Sin demands death. It demands a blood sacrifice. It's why Christ goes to the cross and sheds his blood to pay the price for your sin. And that should be a visible reminder for all of us. Christ hanging on the cross ought to remind us of the consequences of our sin, which ought to cause us not to be so quick to move the way of the world, but to be a little bit more hesitant. And God does the same thing in our text. He gives the people a physical reminder of the consequences of their sin because he says, hang up in the sun all those who have yoked themselves to Baal Peor. Look at verse 4. Look what it says here. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. This shows why you need to stand up. Because sin is grievous and has great consequences attached to it. Think about what's been going on here in our text. Balaam is trying to curse Israel. But the Moabites, it's not working. They can't defeat Israel. They're scared because Israel's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And they're kind of worried. So what do they say? Moabites, the Moabites say, you know what? If you can't beat them, join them. Or better yet, get them to join you. Because then you can pull them out of their camp, out of their church, away from their people, and get them kind of alone and isolated where you can really work on them. That's what they do. They invite them over for a meal. That's what they do. That's their trick. Hey, just come over and have a meal with us. And you know what? The world still does the same thing today. And that's why you need to pay careful attention to what this text is showing. Particularly if you're the head of a home or a leader in a church. Because notice who bears the brunt of the responsibility here. It's the leaders, the chiefs. They're the ones who are hung in the sun. That's the reality. It's why God says to Moses, the chiefs are to be hung in the sun to turn away the Lord's anger. This shows you the heavy burden you bear if you're a husband, a father, or a church leader. Here's the reality. If you're a husband, you bear responsibility for your wife's sin. Don't think you just close your eyes and say, I don't see it, I'm not responsible. You bear responsibility. And women, don't think you're off the hook. Because if you're a parent, a mother or a father, guess what? You bear similar responsibility for the sins of your children. Don't think, I don't see it, it's there. they're on their own. You bear that responsibility. And as a leader in a church, a pastor, elder, a deacon, guess what? You bear responsibility for the lives of the people that God's entrusted to your care. So think about how you live, the example you set before them, the way you model before them. Are you showing how you always go into the world? That's okay? It's safe? Because if you do, guess what? They're going to go the same way. And understand, each and every one of us needs to be very concerned about how easy it is to be led astray. Because it's not just the leaders that bear the responsibility. Yes, they bear primary responsibility, but so do you. Don't think that the chiefs being hung in the sun exonerates your sin. You too stand accountable for it. All of us do. The leader's guilt doesn't exonerate your guilt, your shame. It doesn't take it away. It's why you need to stand up. It's why Jesus stands up for you, so you can do that for him. And you want to stand up so you're not hung up. Like the guys in our text. Look at verse 5. Look what it says. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill those of his men who've yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. This drives home, makes so clear 
why you need to stand up. Because sin carries a very high price. It demands death, a blood sacrifice. This shows how serious the consequences of sin are. Don't think it's just a little lie. I just took a pencil from work. It's not a big deal. It demands a blood sacrifice. Every sin, no matter how small or how big, requires the same death. And this is why Jesus stands up for you. And how does he do so? By laying down his life so you don't bear the consequences of your sin. Because Jesus knows how grave your situation is. How we readily give our affections, our attention to all sorts of idols. Like fortune and fame, wealth and power, our own comfort, our own ease. We gladly put that above suffering or sacrifice for Christ and his church. But how does that last? How does that serve you? It's temporary. Eternity lasts forever. That's why you want to have your focus there. Be thinking upon these things. See, we regularly give what rightly belongs to God to others. Because we think it will give us some temporary happiness. It will give us some temporary joy. We don't think long term. And here's the amazing thing. God is angry about this. You ought to be destroyed. But what does he do? Hear this loud and clear. God so loves you that he sends his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin, to walk in perfect obedience to all, and go to the cross and die in your place. Isn't that amazing? Christ sheds his blood so you don't have to. He does that to appease God's wrath so God's not angry with you because he pours out his anger and wrath on Jesus Christ himself. That's how much Jesus loves you. How can you not want to be around a guy who does that for you? Who do you know that will do that for you? Will your unsaved relative, your unsaved friend, your unsaved boss do that for you? No. But Jesus Christ does. Because that's how much God loves you. That's what he does for you. If you're here this morning and you've never confessed Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, then guess what? Your sin comes with grave consequences. It demands your death. So turn and trust in Jesus Christ knowing that he takes your place on the cross. So you get the forgiveness that he secures for you. See, think about it this way. Your sin requires death. Very high price you got to pay. But you don't have to pay it. You know why? Because Jesus Christ pays it in full on the cross. That's what his atoning death is all about. Stamping out your debt. Making you clear. And he does this because he knows, just like the Israelites in our text, we are so willing to just walk right into sin, not even giving it a second thought. Look at your text. Look at verse 6, what it says here. How this man walks into sin in the midst of this plague. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. This is showing you so clearly why you need to stand up. You've got sin all around you right before your eyes. You probably see it every day. Think about what Moses has just done here. He's just told the people, you need to kill those who've yoked themselves to the Baal Peor. Those who've yoked themselves with the Moabites, put them to death. And what happens? This young man just shamelessly and proudly walks in right before the whole congregation with his new Midianite bride. Hey, mom and dad, check out this woman I just married. Isn't she wonderful? Look how pretty she is. Isn't she amazing? Going right against what God said. And think about it. They've been told, instructed, strike them dead. And what do the people do? Not a thing. They know they should stand up, but instead, they're sitting there. You see what's going on in the text? They're sitting there crying. How the hell did this happen? What has happened? God, why did this happen? You know why it happens? Because they don't want to stand up. They don't want to speak out. So this man's just running rampant in sin. And that's what you want to understand. When you don't stand up against sin, then expect tears to flow. Because that's the result. You see your spouse's sin. You see your child's sin. You see loved one's sin. You don't say a word. Guess what? It's going to cause pain and hardship. Tears are going to flow. You need to be willing to stand up. Understand, you've got people in your life, saved and unsaved, and they're the same because they're sinners. And they sin. So the question becomes, what do you do about it? Do you stand up? Do you say, I'm just one person. I can make a difference. Or do you say, I'm just one person. What can I do? How can I make a difference? You need to stand up. You need to speak out. Because here's reality. 
If you don't stand up, then ask yourself, who will? See, God brings people into your life so you can speak into their life. So you can share the truth of God's word. So you can tell them the consequences of their sin and show them and point them to Jesus Christ who's the answer for their sin. Are you willing to do that? To make a difference? You can do that. You know why? Because Jesus stands up for you. And he does it so you can stand up for others. You can make a difference. Because here's the reality. Jesus lies down so you can stand up. So instead of sitting there crying and weeping and carrying on, why not do as God says and stand up for the one who lies down for you? Which brings us to our third point. Stand up for Jesus. I want you to think about some sin that you're aware of right now. I know you're aware of some sin. Maybe it's your child's fornication. Maybe your husband's anger. Maybe your wife's gossip. Maybe your boss's greed. Maybe your neighbor's idolatry. Maybe your school system, the way they're indoctrinating your kids with all kinds of wicked and unrighteous practices. Maybe your local, state, or federal government who's passing policies that stand directly contrary to Christ and his church. Now ask yourself, as you see all this sin abounding all around, what will you do? Can you make a difference? Or are you saying, I'm just one man and one woman, what can I do? Well, know that you can make a difference. You can stand up for Jesus because Jesus first stands up for you. That's what you see going on right here. See, often what we do is we just sit back silently, closing our eyes, maybe praying, saying, God, just take it all away and make it all better. History shows this. That we see grave atrocities being committed and Christians fail to stand up. Just think about Nazi Germany. Think about modern abortion. Or think about how even today you've got this modern sexual revolution where they're trying to say kids as young as six and eight can change their gender. Now look, here's the reality. People are opposed to genocide. They're opposed to killing babies. And nobody thinks a six-year-old has the wisdom to decide for him or herself what's best for them. But yet, when these things take place, what do we do? When's the last time you stood up against these things? See, what we like to do is complain among ourselves, maybe post something on Facebook. That is until they censure you or kick you off because they don't like what you say. Or maybe we think really mean things or say mean things about these people. They're rotten. They're nasty. I don't like them. I hope God does something with them. But we need to realize you can make a difference if you're willing to stand up for Jesus. See, that's what you've got to do. And you can do this because Jesus stands up for you. Look what you see in our text, how Phineas, one man, makes a huge difference. Look at verses 7 and 8. Look what it says here. When Phineas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. This shows what it looks like to stand up for Jesus, to stand against sin. Now hear me loud and clear. I'm not advocating you for, to take the law in your own hands and commit violence. I'm not saying go murder anybody. Phineas is in a very unique situation. He's been told by God through Moses to do that very thing. God has not told you to do that. What does God tell you? Don't seek vengeance for vengeance is the Lord's. So how do you stand up for Jesus today? Not by taking a spear and piercing somebody, but by doing what? By seeking to get legislation passed. By knowing your local council men and women. And speaking to them and reminding them that they serve at God's behest. God put them there. Maybe doing something like protesting. Instead of giving your money to Amazon, why not protest Amazon? Because they make people work on the Lord's Day and they support ungodly businesses. And how about thinking about how you vote? Not just for who will save you tax dollars, but who will stand up for Christ and his principles. Think about these things. That's how we stand up for Jesus today. That's how you make a difference. Phineas is a priest. He's what? He's the son of Eleazar, the grandson of Aaron. You know what that means? He's got responsibility to atone for the sins of the people. That's why he's not sitting back in his lazy boy, sipping his lemonade, watching Oprah, ordering his Amazon products. He says, I gotta make a difference. I gotta stand up and do something. So what does he do? He stands up and does something. He grabs his spear, and notice what he does. He chases after the man. God's given clear direction. All those who've done this are being put to death. Everybody's sitting there weeping and crying, except Phineas. He says, I can make a difference. So he runs and grabs his spear and chases after the man. Look what it says. He rose and went after. 
Meaning he's chasing after this man and he goes into the chamber. You know what that means? He's going into the tent where this man is consummating his unlawful marriage with this Moabite woman. And what does he do? He does what God says to do. Drives the spear through this man and through this woman. Now think about that. Think about how no one was standing up and doing anything. If they would have. What could have happened? If somebody would have said, imagine this young man's father or mother said, no, you're not hanging out with this Moabite woman. God says not to do this, so I'm not permitting it. What if one of the Israelites said, no, you're not going that way. And they stopped him, tackled him on the ground before he got there. He might have spared this man's life. Spared this woman's life. Prevented this plague. So ask yourself, how can you make a difference? What can you do to stop the plague of sin that's all around us? That you see going on day in and day out. See, Phineas, he cared enough to do something. So ask yourself, do you care enough about your loved one to speak out and speak against their sin? Or do you say, I'm okay, you're on your own. Care enough, love people enough to stand up for Jesus and to speak out and do what needs to be done. Because when Phineas does this, look what happens. It stops God's wrath, turns away his anger, and saves souls. And you see this in verses 8 and 9. Look what it says here. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. That's a lot of people who die because of the sin. And this drives home why you need to stand up for Jesus. Because people all around you are engaged in sin because they're lost and they don't know any better. They need your help. So are you willing to stand up and help? The Israelites are engaged in full-blown sin. God warned them, told them in Deuteronomy 7.3, don't engage in practice with them, warned them to put them to death. And what are they doing? They continue ignoring God's decrees and worshiping by all the payword. And as a result, You've got this horrible plague that's taking place. People are dropping dead left and right. You'd think that'd be enough to get their attention and say, yeah, maybe I ought to rethink what I'm doing. But it doesn't. They continue the same practice. And you know what? You see the same today. Think about all the ways of the world, all the policies, all the things they come up with that don't work, but yet they keep impressing them. How kids continue to harm one another. And we continue to harm kids by giving them false information instead of giving them the gospel. Think about how you see politicians continuing to promote ungodly and unrighteous policies and Christians doing nothing about it. Even Christians stuck in their sin, suffering the same consequences, and it's not enough to get them to turn away and ask for help. If you're stuck in some sin, then ask for help. Say, I need your help. I don't know what to do here. That's why God calls you into a covenantal family, into this covenantal community, so you have help all around. So ask for help. Get the help you need. See, because Christ does this for you. See, the reality is this. We engage in sin because sin is powerful. But you know what? It's nowhere near as powerful or as mighty as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He conquers sin and death for you. That's why he stands up for you. So you can stand up for him. See, because you will never repent of your sin apart from the work and person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ goes to the cross, rises from the grave, ascends on high to send the Spirit so you can repent of your sin. And what does repentance really mean? It's not just saying, I'm sorry for my sin. Repentance is acknowledging that your sin is wrong. It's got disastrous consequences. You've got godly sorrow for it. Godly sorrow that so grieves you that you actually want to turn around and walk a different way and you see fruits of repentance because you're walking a new way. Not engaging the same old practices, but actually seeking to go a different way, to do something differently. And Christ enables you to do that. Think about what you're seeing in our text. The plague is stopped because Phineas pierces this man and this woman. And you know how your sin is stopped? Because Jesus Christ is pierced for you. He's God himself, who leads his throne in heaven, walks in perfect obedience to the law, so you can go to the cross as your perfect atoning sacrifice. He's pierced for your transgressions. That's what you want to think about. Next time you're faced with, which way do I go? Or can I make a difference? Know that you can, because Jesus Christ first makes a difference for you. Jesus stands up for you, so you can stand up for him. Because he lays down his life to bring you from death to life. And he wants you to live for him. 
He takes out your heart of stone, gives you a heart of flesh, and makes you new, which means you think differently, you act differently, you walk differently. No longer saying, what can I do? But recognizing you've got the Spirit indwelling you so you can do as God calls you to do. So instead of weeping and crying, why not stand up for Jesus? And know you can do this because Jesus lies down so you can stand up. Because by lying down, Jesus is actually standing up. Which brings us to our fourth and final point. Jesus stands up for you. You ever get jealous? What do you get jealous about? Are you jealous for your spouse, your kids? How about your name or reputation? What about your God, your church, your pastor? When someone maligns Grace Church, you're not going to punch you in the nose? You get that way for God and His church? Or is it just about your name and your spouse you do that for? See, Phineas, he's jealous for God. He's got a godly jealousy. You see that right here in the text. Why? Because God is a jealous God. The second command tells you that. He's a jealous God. It's why he punishes the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, but blesses for a thousand generations those who love him and keep his commandments. How do you show you love Jesus? By doing what he says, obeying his commands. And that's what Phineas is doing right here. God doesn't want you giving your attentions and your affections to false gods, to idols made of wood and stone. He wants you to give it to him. That's why Jesus stands up for you. So you can have restored to you a right relationship with your Heavenly Father. And you see that in our text. Because Phineas was jealous for God and his people. Look at verses 10 and 11. Look what it shows us. And the Lord said to Moses, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them. So I didn't consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. This shows you what it looks like to have jealousy for God. It's doing what needs to be done for the good of His kingdom and His people to turn them away from their sin. It's why Jesus stands up for you. Because He's jealous for you and your protection. He wants to keep you safe. Safe and secure from incurring God's wrath, God's judgment. Having God put you to death in your sin. So Jesus takes your place on the cross. Does for you what you could never do for yourself. And this ensures that your future is secure. It brings you peace. Notice that language. It brings you peace. You don't need to worry about what you're going through here and now. There might be really hard difficulties you go through in this life. But guess what? Christ has got you. He's watching over you and protecting you. And it'll bring you peace. And you see this. Because of what Jesus' atoning work on the cross is all about. Look how our text ends in verses 12 and 13. Therefore say, Behold, I give him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. This is a picture of how Jesus stands up for you. It's seen in the language of a perpetual priesthood. See, Phineas and his descendants after him, they did not continue forever. In fact, the people fall away. 800 years later, the people of Israel, where do they find themselves? In exile because of their sin. Because they continue to follow after false gods. Bow down to the Baal Peor. That's why they wind up in exile. And this shows us. We need one better than Phineas. That's Jesus Christ. He's the one this text is pointing to. He's the one who tones for your sin in a way that means your sin is gone forever. It is no more. When we talk about Christ's blood shedding and covering and parting, you know, covering over your sins, it's not just pushing it under the carpet. It means it's forever gone. Remembered no more. Smashed away so it no longer exists. That's what his atoning work on the cross does for you. And you know that because Hebrews 7.24 says, Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. That's a perpetual priesthood. Jesus Christ, God himself, rises from the grave, ascends on high, and takes his seat at the right hand of God the Father. And guess what? He doesn't just cover your sins. He continues to intercede for you. How amazing is that? You turn away from Christ, and he continues to stand and plead your case before your heavenly Father. That's how much he loves for you. He goes to the cross and dies for you, rises from the grave to conquer sin and death, ascends on high, gives you his spirit, and takes his seat at the right hand of God so he can make intercession for you. Plead your cause. And that means you're safe and secure and that gives you peace. And that's a atonement that's got a truly lasting impact. See, after Phineas, they had to continue to engage 
in blood sacrifices. But Jesus Christ tells us in Hebrews 10, He died once for all. Jesus Christ says on the cross, It is finished. It is done. Your sin is removed. And how does He do that? Because He stands up for you. And how does Jesus stand up for you? By lying down. Laying down His life for you. In John 10, 17 to 18, He makes this so clear. The Father loves me because I lay down my life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus willingly sacrifices His life for you. That's how He stands up for you. And He does that so you can stand up for Him. So no, you can do that. Because Jesus lies down so you can stand up. Sam now knows he can make a difference. He no longer says, I'm just one man, what can I do? He knows that he can make a difference because Jesus stands up for him. And you know what? You should understand the same thing about yourself. Understand, you've got sin all around you. You're surrounded by Moabites. And they're kind, nice, and friendly enough. But don't think to yourself that what happened to Israelites can't happen to you. Because it can. When we let our guard down, sin can entice us and draw us in. So you need to be on your guard. Be weary. Be careful. Know that sin entices you, just invites you over for a meal. So when the world says, hey, come over for a meal. Let's just hang out. Let's just spend some time together. Be on your guard. And when you see sin abounding, know that you can make a difference. Even though you're just one man or one woman, you can make a difference because Jesus stands up for you. See, Jesus Christ, through His death and resurrection, atones for your sin. And He rises from the grave, ascends on high, and sends His Spirit so you're equipped, enabled, and empowered to stand up for Jesus. So know you can do it, not on your own strength, not on your own wisdom or power, but through the power of the Spirit that indwells you. That's what you rely on. That's what you look to. That's how you know you can stand up. So do just that, because Jesus stands up for you. And He does it so you can stand up for Him and against sin. Brothers and sisters, friends and guests, hear this, get this down. Jesus lies down so you can stand up. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning. We thank you and praise you that you lie down. You willingly give up your life so we might be brought from death to life. We thank you and praise you for your atoning work on the cross. You were willing to be pierced for our sins and our transgressions. Lord, help us to be reminded of these things as we go into the world, Lord, as we seek to share the gospel and hold forth Jesus Christ before a lost and fallen nation. Lord, help us never to be enticed into sin, but to recognize the grave consequences that sin brings. Help us, Lord, to be able to stand up knowing that Jesus first stands up for us. Help us, Lord, to remember Jesus lies down so we might stand up for him. We ask, Lord, we might do justice. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.